Good morning. Uh, we will, I welcome you to the 10th lecture of Systems Engineering today, titled Systems Environment. So, we will be discussing about the environments in within which the system operates. And I am Dr. Deepa Phule from IIT Kanpur. So, we have been uh, studying quite a lot about systems engineering and we slowly started understanding the system, the hierarchy of the system. And now, today we will discuss about what is the environment related to the system. And it is important to know this because today we will also come across the first tool of systems engineering called context diagrams. And also we will see why various tools are, uh, why various, why this tool of understanding the environment of the systems engineering or the system is important. So, uh, in a simplistic sense, if you look at it, systems environment is everything outside of the system that interacts with the system. So, it is, it's, it's a very broad definition. So, you can think about it as a broad definition, okay. Broad definition in which everything outside of the system that interacts with the system. Uh, so, when you say everything outside means it is nothing to do with the part that is within the system and we will see how this classification happens later and they also interact with the system. It is not that it is just staying there, it is also causing some interactions with the system. And uh, why do we need to study the interactions? So, study interactions. Why are these interactions so important? The interactions between the system and the environment, okay. So, the interaction is between system and environment. The interaction gives you such interactions, when you study those interactions, it do result in the developing the various system requirements or it forms the basis for developing. So, the systems engineer when he studies these interactions, it forms the basis for developing the system requirements. And uh, it is also important, it should also be understand that it is important to identify and identify, specify and detail. So, we will add here identify, specify and detail the ways in which the system and environment interacts. Uh, why? Because this is necessary for further system development. Okay. So, it is also necessary for the system life cycle and all those kind of things. And it also creates what we said earlier is it also comes up with the various, the development includes the functional and functional requirements, what the system should do. Okay. And it is, we should also understand that the uh, it is not just the interactions, but their physical basis ok. So, this is this also need to be understood, why because the because by understanding these understanding these requirements will end up reflecting the full range of operating conditions of the system. So, the operating conditions is of the system. So, understanding the interactions and their physical basis both of them helps us to understand the requirements that full reflect the full range of operating conditions of the system. So, it is important that we study the uh, system environment and everything outside of the system that interacts with the system is what we call as a system environment, all right. So, we move to the next one which we talk about the system boundaries. It is a very simplistic definition, uh, but the important part is to identify system environment. If you need to find out what is the environment within the system is operating, specify the system boundaries. It sounds quite simple, uh, 
it says that it simply says what is inside the system and what is outside. It is a simple definition. Um, so, but and it's it's it is quite difficult. So, the the two three difficulties. One is that it need to be clear and specific. What is inside and what is outside? Okay. So this is one part of the uh, aspect. Um, so system boundaries is. Uh, even though it sounds very simple, it is quite difficult because it's, it is to quite difficult to clearly and specifically mention what is inside and what is outside. And it is quite difficult in practice, uh, many deviations and variations are seen in practice. That is the second part. And the other aspect also is that many systems, systems have failed uh, due to miscalculation of misrepresentation, let us call it the worst misrepresentation of what is inside and what is outside. So, the most important, so then these aspects have been already mentioned. So, then the important task is to define what the boundaries are. So, we are here to define what the boundaries are though done differently by different organizations. This boundary definition, defining the boundaries is usually done quite differently from organization to organization. So, depending upon where you are and what you are dealing with, you will probably find um, different ways of doing it. But at the end of the day, all it amounts to it is it is defining clearly and specifically defining what is inside and what is outside. So, there are few criteria that will actually help us in making this uh, decision. Uh, the, so, the criteria is to assess, uh, it is to assess, uh, we will kind of keep this portion away, it is to assess uh, whether an entity, we already seen what an entity is, entity is a part of the system. This is what we are trying to do. The criteria is assess whether it is part of the system or not. So, the first criteria is what we call as developmental control. The development control is that the the first question we ask is uh, the developer, did the developer, developer had control over the entity's development. So, first question is the, did the developer, the person who developed the system had control over the entity's development and another question that also usually asked is, is the funding um, for the entity part of developers budget. So, did somebody pay for developing this? So, most probably then it will be part of the system. So, it would be a part that would be inside that is associated with the system. That is one way to look at it. And if the answer to this is no, one of these questions is no, then there are many different questions asked by different organizations. So, I am just giving some few examples of what type of questions are. Another aspect you could think about it is operational control. So, here the question is in field, will the entity be 
under the operational control uh, of the organization uh, that controls the system. If you ask this question, then it is uh, quite possible that okay, if the entity is also controlled by the same organization that controls the system, most probably it is part of this. Another question is, will another organization can have ops control? Is this also possible? So, this question also becomes part of the uh, part of assessing the operational control. Then another aspect of it what we talk about it is a functional allocation. Uh, the third aspect, uh, third aspect we can think about it. The functional allocation is the question usually is that during functional allocation, uh, did the systems engineer allowed uh, system systems engineer allocated functions to this entity. So, did the systems engineer allocated the functions to this entity at the time of the functional allocation studies? If the answer is yes, probably this system will be part or this entity will be part of the system. And finally, what we call as the unity of purpose, which is this is this entity dedicated to systems success? This is another question. So, you and you can it is very common that lot of the industries and organizations who are in the systems development will have multitude of questions. These are some few representative questions that you can create to clearly delineate whether the entity is within the system or outside the system. The important part is that if you cannot clearly define the boundary, if the system boundaries are not clearly defined, then it is very hard to identify the system environment. So, those are the two aspects that we need to keep in mind. So, this exercises of understanding what is inside the system and what is outside the system, though appears to be trivial, is quite difficult. And also what happens is, um, some of the other aspect is, we, before we get into this context diagram, we also need to think about few things. The first aspect that we talk about this is what we call as the operators. They are an important part of the system. Usually the question comes is whether the operator is a part of the system. This is a question usually. And the answer to that always is that operator is external. Though there are organizations who consider them as internal, but most of the time the operators are considered as external to the system. Um, and the reason for that it is there is no way you can control the operator as such. Uh, and you think that the, there are multiple of, multiple type of people will operate the system and everybody will have their own styles and aspects. So, the way they operate the system will be different. Hence, the systems engineer will focus on the SE will focus on what he will focus on the interface interface which is critical to the system success. So, the important aspect, the systems engineering aspect is the interface, interface where the operator and the system interacts, the interface of the operator and the system is what the systems engineer will focus on uh, rather than focusing on the type of the operator because operators can change. Uh, similarly, uh, the other aspect is um, uh, sometimes the operating environment uh, like roads, uh, service stations, etc., are external to the vehicle system. Sometimes people do argue that, well, you look at the road and then you design the vehicle or design the suspension. So, it is uh, 
uh, part of the system. Not really true. Uh, I am using this as an example uh, because uh, the vehicle usually will get de designed for operating on different type of roads like maybe a concrete road, well paved road, roads with uh, potholes, uh, rough terrain, it could be off-roading multiple ways. So you do not really design the suspension for just one particular country, you actually try to develop it for multiple different type of surfaces. You cannot expect the same surface of road to exist all over the place. So considering road or otherwise people will talk about okay, the service stations, the availability of the service stations is also another aspect of vehicle design or the system of vehicles how, they, how we design it, not necessarily true. Uh, you, the um, presence and absence of a service station in a locality is not a factor of how you design the system or how you design the vehicle. So those are also things that are external to the system. Uh, so these are some of the common examples where I have seen people making these mistakes, but I thought I will point it out before we get into this. Okay. So now we talk about the context diagram. So this is the first tool that we actually learn as part of the systems engineering. And what context diagram? It is an important communication tool. So first and foremost, it is a communication tool. Communication tool between the users, the systems engineers, the designers and everybody to understand what is a system and what is the um, uh, entities and how the interactions, the boundaries and as well as the system environment. So context diagram is an important communication tool that is the most, most important part of it. And what does it do is it effectively displays the external entities and their interactions with the system. So the external entities and the interactions with the system are displayed, displayed how? They are displayed in pictorial format. You can see that a lot of the tools that are used by systems engineers are in pictorial format because a picture is worth 1000 words. So it actually helps in understanding the system and the boundaries. It also falls into this particular category called the black box diagram. It is called a black box diagram because the system, system is represented, it is represented as a, a central box uh, without any details. So you kind of draw a box and say system in it. So this is like you do not know what the system is doing, there is some system there. So the entire thing is unknown to you, you do not know what is going on inside, the specific details are not available. Hence this appears to be as like a black box to you. So such diagrams where the details are not available are actually called as the black box diagrams. So the context diagram actually also fall into this criteria. And there are three major components of the context diagrams. And the three components are number one is the external entities, number two is the system and number three is the interactions. And we will see what each of them are. So the external entities, the external entities they constitute, constitute all entities with which the system will interact. So you, what we are doing here is that the we are defining the the all entities with which the system will interact. So in another way to uh, think about it is some of them will be some will be inputs or some will be providing inputs. Some cases it will be out outputs. So the system's output might be used for it, and some cases it will be. Uh, also things like uh, uh, feedback and uh, or other uh, threats stuff like this. This is also part of it. So uh, we will see this in detail, but some of them may provide input, some of them will provide output and some of them will probably be providing feedback and other aspect to system. But they all interact with the system in one way or other. Then we talk about what is the system. We already been defined system, system, system many times, but in the context diagram, it is just a square oval circle, uh, let me call it as a box, it is not just a box, it is a square box or an oval or a circle um, 
with just the name of the system. Uh, there are variations of context diagram with where people have specified the details of the system, but not necessarily the typical classical uh, context diagram expects just you to draw a box or a novel or a circle and put the name of the system there and that just represents the system. Uh, because understand that the focus of this context diagram is to display the external entities and their interactions with the system. It is not a tool to diagram the system, it is a tool to diagram the environment of the system, the entities of the system and the interactions of them with the system. So, the system is just kind of there, say that here is a system, I mean what are the other nitty gritty details of it, you are not uh, worried about it. And then we talk, talk about interactions, the third component of the interactions. So, they are typically represented by arrows or um, lines with arrowheads. And there are multiple conventions used here again, some people use these kind of arrows, some people use double sided arrows, stuff like this. So, the trick here is that what do these arrows do? They displays or documents. Uh, interactions between entities and the system. So, these arrows represents the in interactions between them. Uh, you should recommended is a uh, single head arrow. Usually people prefer to use this or this, because this uh, the double head arrow, why do you use single head arrow? Double head can cause ambiguity, because we said in the earlier slide that uh, it is a difficult process and if there is any confusion in this regard, when you are classifying a material or an entity which is actually an external entity as an internal entity then the behavior of the system will be significantly affected and there are many instances where it has resulted in the failure of the system. So, the um, arrowhead, the arrowhead represents the direction of the in interaction. So, whether it is going to the system or going into the system, out of the system, all those kind of aspects is being uh, displayed by the direction of the arrowhead. And as I said earlier, uh, it is usually preferred to use a single head arrow to minimize ambiguity in this case. So, let us see how does it, uh, um, uh, how does it look like real realistically. So, the first box, the black box what we talked about, this is the black box that I was talking about. It is just a box in which the name of the system is put in. And then, you have different entities, I just put external entity, external entity like this, but you can put the name of the external entity which are the ones that are interacting with the system. And then we have different arrowheads, single arrowheads showing the directions of what is coming into the system and what is going out of the system. And these entities are typically data, signals, materials, energy and activity. So, I, uh, we have already mentioned what is this, uh, uh, these aspects, the data signals, materials, energy and activity, uh, because earlier we have seen these as the entities of the system in the previous uh, example. Uh, the uh, data is, as we said earlier, data was the stationary information, signal we know that is the communication info. We saw material as the one that provides the structure and transformation, energy, power the system and activity that is what system 
may perform. So, all these things are part of the, uh, the interactions. So, you can kind of think about, I will show an example, you could create something like a situation like here, you can say this as external entity and you might have something like this as uh, signal and you can say as material. So, in an example this could be the external entity could be somebody like a, a raw material supplier. Uh, or instead of raw material, let us call it as a uh, projectile supplier. So, let us say this is a field artillery gun, then the uh, a signal goes to the guy who supplies the projectile says that okay, we are running out of uh, projectiles, so please supply and then the material, the rounds of the artillery rounds actually get supplied back to that. Similarly, you could have a situation where you can actually have a, um, a data coming in and uh, you have an entity and the power going inside. So, something like this could be a, uh, a power generator or something like this. So, somebody says ok fine we run we require more power or more uh, electricity run out. So, then an external generator actually supplies the power to the system. This typically happens in the UAV systems and all. So, if you think about it you can, so by doing this diagram it becomes a very simplistic mechanism and the arrowhead says, arrow, arrowhead you can write what you are doing whether it is materials, whether it is energy, whether it is data, whether it is signal, all those kind of things when you write on to the arrow, arrowhead, arrow and it points the, the arrowhead shows the direction. So, that means here the signal has gone from the system to the external entity and the material has gone from the external entity to the system. So, it tells you the flow, the interaction. So, this is what we call as the interaction in a diagrammatic fashion. So, I hope you guys understand the context diagram which is a simple graphical tool to understand the system and the external entities, its interactions. So, in a way what we are doing here is the we are talking about the system environment, system boundaries. both are covered as part of the uh, context diagram. So, we talked about the system interactions and uh, system interactions as I said earlier, uh, it is uh, we basically grilled it down to the entities as data, signals, materials, energy and activities. So, uh, we can think about another way to think about it is that the, I will kind of use some part of this uh, slide for explaining the background behind it. The interactions can be def defined into interactions can be number one it can be primary interaction ok. So, what is a primary interaction? It involves elements that interact, interact with systems, systems primary functions. The primary functions include input, the output and control. So, mostly all elements that interact with the system's primary functions are what we call as the primary interactions and then there is something called as a secondary interactions which involves elements, all elements that interact, interact uh, with the system, interaction is always with the system in an indirect non-functional manner. So, here an example of this is the ambient temperature. So, you have a heating and a cooling system, then the ambient temperature outside is one factor that determines the system how much of uh, cooling is required and what level of cooling is required, how much of uh, electricity energy is needed to generate that much of cooling or lower the temperature of the room to a one particular level is an example of that. So, the ambient temperature outside is an example of uh, uh, secondary uh, 
uh, interactions. So now um, the uh, we will talk about what is the inputs and output outputs. So the inputs and outputs, as I said earlier, this is part of the primary interactions. And what do they do? The typically the system operates to external stimuli. Stimuli is some can be data, it can be feedback or whatever it is. The, it operates to external stimuli and or materials, it can be stimuli or materials. And what does it do? It processes the inputs in a useful way to provide some reasonable output. So, the inputs are provided by the system by sensing the external stimuli and or looking or getting on the feedback on materials and stuff like that and then it processes. So, in a manufacturing system the external stimuli is the materials, the material arrived then yes you modify them and then produce a part which becomes an output. And then the output is based on the input that actually come in a and the important part is it is in a useful way. The as I mentioned earlier uh, operators or human beings are usually external to the system. Um, an example like a common confusing example, I will just use this part. An example of this is people say pilot is internal to the system. I have seen people doing this classification. Uh, well, not necessarily. Here because a pilot has an interface to react or interact with the system. Uh, that is be using the, the CRTs, then the control stick or the joystick, uh, throttle lever, uh, etc. Uh, CRT will provide him the uh, feedback or how the system is performing, which has various signals. Joystick is where the inputs comes into picture, throttle is also an input. Okay and the behavior of the aircraft, the flying, the it is gaining altitude, losing altitude, turning, yawing, uh, all those kind of things just pitching, all this part of the behavior uh, system is doing something useful based on the inputs of the uh, uh, pilot. So, if you take uh, the pilot X or take pilot Y, it does not matter as long as they are trained, they are both capable of operating the system. So, you do not design a aircraft for a specific pilot you design it for a person, any person who has a sufficient training to operate the system. So, in a way a pilot is even though the person sits inside the system and operates it, the person is external to the system. So, the human control interface um, as I said, mentioned earlier uh, is, uh, is of significant importance because the uh, operators of the human beings are usually external to the system and these are the people who actually they operate and hence the interface is primary. So, if the pilot interface is not very good, then the behavior of the aircraft or the, the, it will be quite hard to control the aircraft. Uh, some people do uh, make fun about certain uh, uh, interfaces designed by uh, in earlier days because people sometimes say you design an aircraft and then you put a pilot in it and you hope that the pilot figures it out kind of a thing. So, then the off late then ergonomics, anthropometry and all other aspects control system design etcetera all came into picture and then the uh, cockpit was redesigned uh, for uh, better, uh, uh, better control of the aircraft and less fatigue making the operations more efficient and stuff like that. That is all part of the systems engineering. So, the human control interface is also a primary aspect of the system uh, because as I mentioned earlier, input, output and control are the three aspects. So, all these three are primary.
Now we talk about the operational maintenance. This is kind of tricky uh, because uh, some people classify this as primary, some people classify this as secondary. Uh, it can be classified as somewhat, I use this word in a, in its sense somewhat primary and secondary as well. Why? Because the uh, at a certain point of time after the system has been operating for some time, it reaches a point where the maintenance has to be performed without which the system cannot proceed forward. So, at that point it becomes a very necessary important function that need to be it, it directly it would interact with the system directly uh, and it will influence the primary functions of the system at that point. But once you are done with the maintenance, then until the next maintenance, the maintenance infrastructure is not interacting with the system. So, it is like if you think about it, if you think about it in a time scale, a time t and if you map the interactions of uh, maintenance, it will be uh, if you start this as a time t equal to 0, it will continue like this and at a particular point when a particular t reaches, uh, t1 reaches, then the interaction goes up to a level and stays steady and when the maintenance is done, then the interactions goes down, so t2. So, within this time period, the operational maintenance stuff is interacting with the system. It is interacting with the system, it is directly influencing its primary functions. Then for some time, it will not do anything. Then after some time, then the T3, when the next maintenance comes in, again the interaction comes in. And you can see that at each time, this length can vary depending upon you know, the time of interaction will vary depending upon at what time it is. Like classical example is the ship uh, overhauls. The basic overhauls, the two simple overhauls are uh, might be cheaper, but the uh, are a shorter duration, but the major overhaul, the large refit what we call it as, that is where it actually takes a considerable amount of time and resources and other things. And at the time period, the shipyard in which the ship is being maintained is also directly interacting with the system. So, at that time, it is kind of uh, primary stuff, but once the ship leaves the shipyard and then it is not coming back, uh, at that time it is no longer primary. So, the operational maintenance, sometimes people classify it as primary, sometimes it is classified it as secondary. So, it's a, it is the only quasi uh, confusing interaction uh, is part of as part of the systems. Now, we talk about the physical environment and the uh, physical environment as I said earlier, uh, they are they, sub, they provide support to the system mostly. So, the first thing that we talk about is the support systems. So, what is a support system? So, the support system is the part of infrastructure, part of infrastructure uh, on which the system depends uh, for executing the mission. A simple example of this is the airport and aircraft. So, the aircraft depends, aircraft depends upon airport to execute the mission of takeoff, landing, loading, unloading, all those kind, maintenance, etcetera. So, the, uh, so this is the physical environment. So, depending up, uh, at if different airports, the runways will be of different size, it will be having different width, different elevations, different operating conditions, etcetera. There could be rain, there could be snow, there could be sun, there could be crosswinds, so many aspects as part of this. But the aircraft as a system is dependent upon the airport to do some of the, some of its functions. So, it is a part of that infrastructure on which the system depends for executing the mission is what we call as the support systems and that is related to the physical environment of the system. Now, we talk about is the system housing. So, the system housing, it is not the house's housing, but it is mostly the, the installation side provides 
sometimes or I would say many times uh, protection to the system elements. or it just provides a platform. So, if you have a like you can think about it as a thing that is being installed in a bunker and also just mounted on a ship uh, where it is exposed to the sea and other kind of conditions. So, many a times uh, the housing, the installation site do act as a protection, sometimes it will not act as a protection, it just exposes the system to all the possible hazards. So, uh, you can think about some of the examples will be bunker will be an example uh, of an artillery gun which offers protection and a exposed uh, let us say navigation equipment or uh, on a ship you can think about or just the gun just mounted on the ship without any protection or casing is another example of uh, uh, where it is just providing a platform, just a mechanical platform. So, that is also both possible. Then we talk about what we call as the threats. So, there are two ways we can talk about threats. It can be either man-made or natural. One of the example is that sea water corroding the ship or uh, ship hull, uh, ship let us talk about ship, ship as a system. So, the system is exposed to it is a natural threat, sea water is uh, corrosive and it corrodes attacks the hull and it keeps on corroding the hull. So, that is a natural one. On the other hand is a man made one is think about an ATM automatic telling machine being robbed as a man made threat, it is not a natural threat. So, person is going to uh, steal money from an ATM because there is money available and he thinks that he or she can do that. So, that aspect uh, is a man made threat. So, the threats are also part of the physical environment in which the system is operating. Uh, so, like uh, if the ATM is in a remote area, the chances of it getting uh, attacked will be much higher compared to when it is near to a place where there is strict security is available. Then we also talk about it is something called as a shipping and a handling because what happens is this is the movement of the system from manufacturing site to operational site, operations site. So, um, you can think about it is the uh, how uh, space agencies move rocket parts to launch sites. So, uh, there are so many dedicated specialized equipment that is necessary to safely move the uh, components of the system to the place where the system will be installed and used. So, that is also an aspect Then the reason why you need that kind of a uh, so shipping and handling requirement is because of the delicacy or special requirements of the system. So, the support systems, the systems housing, the threads and the shipping and handling, these are the four things that we talked about which are aspects of the physical environment of the system and how that affects the uh, creates different interactions and so in resulting in how different entities react to the system. So, I hope that by this you guys have understood how to look into the systems environment, how to use context diagram to map the environment and the boundaries of the system and uh, how some of the aspects, some of the entities, how they can they create the input output, the, then the threads, then the housing, all those aspects, how the system interacts with the uh, environment and how it impacts the behavior or as well as the successful capabilities of the system in delivering the function it is intended to design. Uh, thank you very much and we will catch in the next lecture.